Let's give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. All members, even those of over overseas, let's greet each other. Let's, let us have a time of the gospel. Today's message is entitled, Let us discard what we must discard. Today is the last Lord's Day of the year 2023 and also the last day of 2023. This year, we held on to the covenant of may all the nations be possessed. And we also opened the inaugural age of 237 missions. It was a time schedule of becoming equipped with the system to fulfill the evangelization of the 237 nations and 5,000 people groups. There were 237 church officers who were raised, and we also established elders appoint, appointed to each of the 237 nations, and all remnants and all church members casted lots and picked a nation. That kind of spiritual atmosphere and missions organization was established that way. For a church this large to establish such a 237 missions, I think our church is the first ever in the world. I've never heard of that before. We're the very first to do this. The least will make a, na a mighty nation. I believe that that public message will be established, that covenant will be established and fulfilled in our church. There were many unfamiliar nations that made us wonder whether such countries had ever existed. Countries that we had heard for the very first time in our lives. There are some people who picked those nations. Even after picking their nation, they might have thought, oh, were there, was there ever a nation named this? Perhaps if we had not established a 237 mission system, there were many small nations that would have just been dismissed and overlooked. But now, we embrace those nations and we make them our prayer topic, and we're able to pray for that. How remarkable of a start is that? Every week, a forum is written by one of the 237 Continental Church officers. From church officers to remnants, they start by introducing their chosen nation and also share how they will evangelize that field, and they share their prayer topics. Many nations that we might have just overlooked because we were so unfamiliar of those nations have now come into our prayer ra radar. And although we've never been there and we don't even know that country very well, but since God has allowed me to choose this nation and now that God has called me to pray for that nation, and now that we have all the information about those nations online and through dictionaries, we're able to pray for them. And I believe that this is a significant progress in our missions. Through the New Year's message, I will share more specifically about our direction for next year. But may you truly believe that God has a special plan for our Yewon Church and look forward to the works God will do through us in 2024. As the last Lord's Day of 2023, it must be a time to prepare your hearts, the soil of your heart, the soil, soil of your faith, to be able to receive answers for the coming new year. That is why today's title is, Let Us Discard What We Must Discard. Up until 2023, all the things that I was stubborn about, all the things I held on to that were incorrect, let us discard all that and greet this new year. Why? Because you have to receive the new answers that God has prepared. But because of these obstacles, because you're unable to discard what you must discard, you're unable to receive answers and a year just passes by. And you've repeated that for many years. How sad is that? There are answers that God has prepared for you, and yet there are these obstacles. And that's what lets us discard all of that. Apostle Paul, Paul emphasizes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Your new self. 
It's a new year. Now you have to become a new self. Put off the old self and put on the new self. Let us say that together. Put off the old self and let us put on the new self. The author Mark of the book of Mark compares a legalistic religious life and a graceful gospel life in the first parts of the book of Mark. But this doesn't just stop with once. But this comparison is repeatedly mentioned multiple times. This refers to the need to be ready for a spiritual level that aligns with the newly opened gospel age, the spiritual level, the identity and level. You have been chosen, you have been given an identity, but the level is not, does not align with that identity. You should no longer be inside the frames of the legalistic and incorrect frames of the past. This does not only pertain to the times of Jesus, but even today, there are many people who live a life bound to old frames. That habit and nature that came from their life that was once an unbeliever. And with that, they come into the church. They carry that into the church with that habit. Today, a day before 2024, may all the believers of Yewon Church, like today's message's title, completely discard all spiritually futile and useless things. Therefore, I bless you in the name of the Lord that you may stand as the main figure of the fulfillment of the covenant that God will fulfill in the new year. Number one is religious life of formality. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Mark mentions and refers to the old frame that needs to be discarded through fasting. In Judaism, fasting was seen as an indicator of a devout and committed life to religious loves. What was an expression of religious effort and diligence? It was fasting. However, in the passage, we see people approaching Jesus and questioning why his disciples are not fasting when the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees are fasting. Mark chapter 9 reveals that those asking these questions were not just an average people, but specifically the disciples of John the Baptist. Let's say that that's plausible for the Pharisees, but let alone John, the disciples of John the Baptist appear to be tied to a life of religious formalism. In fact, John the Baptist was sent by God in advance to prepare the way for Jesus. And John the Baptist, he faithfully fulfilled this very mission that was given by God. He thoroughly concealed himself and revealed only Jesus Christ, and he delighted in that. If you look at Mark chapter 1, verse 7, he said that he was not even worthy to untie the strap of Jesus' sandals. And John 3.30 states, He must increase, but I must decrease, he says. This was how much John the Baptist focused and aligned his life only on revealing Christ. However, the disciples of John the Baptist should have been in that spiritual flow, but they were unable to move away from a religious life of formality and they were unable to be in a position worthy of the new age of the gospel like John the Baptist. They were still bound by that habit and that, that traditions and customs of Judaism. And they were completely seized by the frames of religious formality, and they were unable to come out of that. It was no different from when the Pharisees had come and asked why the disciples and Jesus were eating with tax collectors and sinners. Is the sin to eat with someone? That's why legalism is such a fearsome thing. 
they ask Jesus why they do not fast, it's the same thing. If Jesus was not fasting, if they had noticed that, they should have assumed that there must be a reason for that. Instead, these individuals who are unable to come out of that religious frame, they accuse Jesus of being wrong. They say, Jesus, you are incorrect. You are incorrect. You went against the law. They dare to say that to Jesus. Through the parable of the wedding feast, Jesus breaks the frame of formal religious life that they had. Verse 19 says, And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. If you look at the passage, Jesus did not deny fasting itself and say that fasting itself was incorrect. But he says that there is a time to fast and a time to not fast. Jesus asks whether wedding guests can fast while they are they are with the bridegroom how can you fast can you imagine a wedding guest saying fasting while they are at a wedding oh I'm fasting then it would be better for you to not even come they come to a wedding feast and they say they're fasting does that make sense that's what Jesus is saying Jesus he is a spiritual bridegroom He's saying he refers to himself as a spiritual bridegroom. And when Jesus returns, he comes as a spiritual bridegroom. And because he is the bridegroom, as long as you are with me, you do not have to fast. That is what he's saying. How unnatural would it be to see guests at a wedding feast fasting? And he gives us two parables about that. So that we must completely break away from the religious life of formality and live a new gospel life. Verse 21 No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and the worse tear is made. The first parable that Jesus told is about a piece of unshrunk cloth. Attaching a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old garment may look normal at first. However, if the unshrunk cloth gets wet or it is rained on, then it starts to shrink. Then when that happens, the old clothes may be torn even further. The old garment here signifies legalism that in which only Formality remains the traditions of old laws. And what does the piece of unshrunk cloth signify? It talks about the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Through, through this word, Jesus is referring that the walk of faith is not something that we must moderately compromise. But Jesus did not, and it says that it, it tells us that Jesus did not come to simply sew old cloth, clothes of sin and the law, but he came to dress us in completely new clothes of the gospel. Verse 22 reads, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. In his second parable, he talks about new wine. A characteristic of new wine is that it is not completely fermented yet. But what would happen when this new wine is contained in an old wine skin that lacks elasticity? The new, as the new wine ferments and expands, it eventually will burst. The new wine should be contained in a new wine skin to store it properly. Here, the new wine refers to the new gospel of Jesus Christ, the new gospel of Jesus Christ, and the old wineskin refers to the nature of legalism that cannot bear the new gospel. The characteristic of the nature of legalism is that it, it has extremely weak receptivity. It is unable to under, un, understand. 
And that's why when something bothers them or it doesn't align with what they believe is right, then it bursts. They're always, they are easy to anger. And they are deceived by that. They're completely bound by a nature of legalism. After meeting Reverend Yu, and if I had not realized the gospel centered on Jesus Christ, then I would not be able to stand here. Why? Because I once used to fast many times as well. I would fast three days a month. And, you know, if, if I felt uneasy, then I felt, oh, or if I felt like I sinned in my heart, then I would go right on ahead to fast. I would go to the prayer halls so often. And many pastors say that. They say, if we had not met Reverend Yu and not realized the gospel, then we probably would have passed away by now. One of the pastors, they used to fast for 40 days. And if you don't fast well, then people, things might happen and there might be complications with your body and people might start to stutter and they might find other complications in their physical body. And so many pastors in this ministry, they say, if we had not realized and understood the gospel, then we would have passed away by now. But because we realized the gospel, we're alive now. It's not just that. Now we're being used for world evangelization. We're so moved and we're so grateful for that, that we have realized the gospel. Before, we were all about accusing people, condemning others, myself as well. you know. And it was all about repentance and just condemning myself. And whenever we go to prayer halls, all we did was repent. We'd call upon the Lord. We'd shout and shout until our voices were hoarse. And that's why now we've made prayer halls for our church in single prayer rooms so that you can cry out as much as you want. Because I used to, I always wanted to have a place where I could pray and shout out loud as much as I want, but going to those prayer halls were so time consuming. So I we created prayer rooms here. I'm not saying that prayer, individual prayer time is not important. It, that is completely needed. But if you are held in legalism, by if you're held and seized by legalism, it's all about negative things and accusing and condemning things. And so your faith does not grow and you hinder others from growing as well. And things just don't work out because legalism is about just killing your, you and others as well. But what is the gospel? It's about saving each other and yourself as well. If problems come, then Jesus is the Christ, the solution and the answer to all things. So how grateful are we? It's so important to realize this gospel. And that is why Jesus says the new, that new wine must be contained in a new wineskin. You must live a completely new life of a gospel nature. And that's why as we age, it's harder and diff more harder to change. And it's not easy to change into a gospel nature. For our young remnants, it's easy because you're growing in the gospel. And I am very excited for their future. We've already placed and set the platform, and our posterity will surely do the evangelization of two to seven nations and 5,000 people groups. A pastor, William Gurnall, a Puritan, once said, one who goes to church regularly and volunteers for penance to do good deeds does not know how he is naked spiritually. He, they do all these good deeds and they put in a lot of effort, but they are naked spiritually. They volunteer all they can. However, they're naked spiritually. What does that mean? I'm not saying that hard work, volunteering, and good deeds in a pious life are bad. However, hard work and effort that is done without knowing the gospel and that is done without coming to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ And people put all their effort and diligence into that, thinking that that will give them salvation in a state where they don't know the gospel properly and correctly. One day, if they are not noticed and recognized, they're completely tempted and they're com and discouraged by that. And they, they, they think, oh, God does not answer me after, even after I've done all these things. 
a person who, whose everything is not Christ, they only shame themselves even more. It is meaningless before God. May you work hard inside the gospel. May you volunteer in the gospel. May you ha com have communion with each other and serve one another in the gospel. May all members of Yewon Church hold on to the essence of the gospel. Disregard and discard all the formalities and religious formalities and live a festive life with Jesus. Your life needs to be a feast. My life needs to be a spiritual feast. My spiritual state needs to be a feast. It needs to be heaven. That's the individual that has confidence. Therefore, in the new year of 2024, I bless in the name of the Lord that there may be a spiritual dynamic of joy springing into you and the lives that you meet in every field that you go to. Point number two is a legalistic condemning mindset. Verses 23 to 24 says, when Sab On Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? As Jesus began his public ministry, many miracles and healing and works occurred. And as he proclaimed the gospel of heaven while performing these works of miracles and healing, he, taught, he proclaimed the word of the kingdom of God, and as people heard this word that they had never heard before, it felt like they, if they, it felt like a fresh breath of new air. And so wherever Jesus went, crowds followed him. As people's interests gathered on Jesus, there were individuals that started to get nervous. Powers that started to get nervous. They were the Pharisees and the scribes were the leaders. At that time, they were the religious leaders. And they believed that there was only one religion, and that's Judaism. But then the son of a carpenter suddenly appeared, and he started to bring all these crowds to him. Now they, they had... They were extremely nervous and uneasy because of that. They had a very serious crisis mentality and tried to find any fault to slander Jesus. So they closely followed Jesus and his 12 disciples and observed them. And they observed whether they would, they would go against the law or not. At last, they had finally found something. They saw that the disciples with Jesus, as they were going through the grain fields, they saw that the disciples began to, to cut off some grains and pluck the heads of it and eat it. They, were, they saw that the disciples were plucking heads of grains on, and were eating it. At that time, this was not a cultural problem, but the problem and the issue was that they did this on the Sabbath. One of the sabbatical laws was to not work on the day of the Sabbath. They were not working, was completely prohibited on the day of Sabbath. Even, even the Jews who live in America on Sabbath, they are unable to even turn on the gas or they can't press on an, the elevator button. When we look at that, it seems like they're, they've gone mad. It's still the same 2,000 years ago and even today. These practices remain the same. Riding on a car, even us, we used to be like that too. Long ago, if we were to study on Sundays, we would get disciplined. And if we bought something on a Sunday to eat, if we that was something that would cause us to be cursed. And, you know, if you open your eyes while you're praying, then, you know, you were doomed. That's what we were taught when we were younger. It was a very scary and fearsome God. So no one's face were, were peaceful. Everyone was just so uptight and scared. You know, the praise would say, my soul is at peace. But then when you look at the faces that were saying those praise, they were all seized by legalism. 
So today in the passage, these Pharisees accused the disciples saying that them plucking the heads of the grain was an act of working and therefore were going against the Sabbath. They said that plucking heads of grain was seen as the same thing as harvesting and threshing. And since they worked on the Sabbath, they had broken the law of the Sabbath. So Jesus so was so flabbergasted by this. And he brings David as an example and explains. Verse 5 says, And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, we see that David was be busy fleeing from King Saul. And because he was so in such, in such hurry, he was unable to find things to eat. And he was starving. At that time, David and his workers had no choice but to eat the snow bread or the bread of presents that only the high priest could eat. In other words, he had broken the law. But people, but Jews perceived Abraham David as the model of their faith. If these two individuals are mentioned, the Jews couldn't do anything about it. And so he, Jesus says, bringing this example up, did God condemn them? Did God punish them for that? After leaving them speechless, Jesus said these words in the passage, verses 27 to 28. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath. The reason the Sabbath exists is for man. If there is no man, there is no Sabbath. This is also why David was given the bread of the presence so that he can live. Once again, Jesus focuses on saving lives than keeping traditions and formalities. Then he continues to say something very important. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In other words, this means that Jesus is the only one who can give us true rest and true Sabbath. It only exists in Christ Jesus. The sin of Adam, the first man that took place in Genesis chapter 3, made every human being and all humanity fall into sin and lose the true Sabbath. There is no rest. So people who are unable to meet God who have not been saved, even though it may seem like they are happy, they don't have true rest, true Sabbath. And to try to find that, what did humans make? They, make? they made religion. To find true rest, they, made, they tried to make religion. They also make a lot of philosophical effort. And they practice moral kindness and strive for different and various answers to find true rest. However, the more they do that, they are in, it goes in vain. The more they do that, they are, they, it's in vain. Only void despair and discouragement comes. These problems will end only when you meet Christ Jesus, the one and only Lord of the Sabbath. Therefore, those who are saved, the content of their lives must be different. It must be different from unbelievers. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 shows us the important lessons of Jesus. But even then, the sense of legalistic condemnation showed no signs of change. It's quite fearsome. Legalism is such a fearsome thing. They did not change at all. They simply watched Jesus' every move to find something to accuse him. whether Jesus would break the law or not. They did not think about receiving grace. All they did was check and keep in mind. But they had no posture or mindset to change. 
it happened that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And there was a man with a withered hand. They wanted to make a case against Jesus if he healed a man with a withered hand because it was on the day of Sabbath. According to their custom, healing could only take place on the Sabbath if a life was in danger. The man with the withered hand was not in immediate danger of death, so there was no reason for Jesus to heal him on the day of Sabbath. However, Jesus, knowing their intentions once again, Jesus asked this question, Mark chapter 3, verses 4 to 5, and he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Amen. Jesus emphasized the fact that saving lives comes first and foremost and then heals the man with the withered hand. When you look at the situation, the Pharisees were not interested in the man's restoration at all, whether his withered hand was healed or not. All they were focused on was how they could accuse Jesus. In the same situation, what you think and what you see could dramatically change the course of your life. Completely change the course of your life. All members and believers of Yewon Church, may you completely come out of all things that are futile to saving lives and from all legalistic condemning mindsets. And may you become an absolute gospel nature. This is the conclusion. There was a deacon who sat very tall and had a very large head. During worship, whenever he would, this deacon would sit, the people behind him wouldn't be able to see anything. He could, they could barely see the pastor's face. It was another day before service began. This deacon, who was very tall and, a large, and had a large head, sat down in the pews, a deacon behind him said, "Ah, well, I guess we're done for the day. We've given our worship today already. The big-headed and tall deacon turned around and replied, Oh, there is no place for, for me to lay my head. He quoted what Jesus, has said, what Jesus had said. What is this? This is the gospel. You have to laugh and you have to, you know, talk, laugh and just communicate with each other. What are you, you going to do if you have a large head? Of course, perhaps it might be good to sit on the outskirts of the pew so that you don't affect others. But just because it does not happen to be so, if would it be, would it be okay for you to have conflict and be conflicted because of that? As you live your walk of faith and as you come to church, what kind of perspective you have is very important. How you speak and act is very important. As we close this year, 2023 today, may all believers of Yewon Church completely discard all religious life of formality, all life that's centered on yourself it's all futile. It won't let you grow. Do not stop condemning and accusing others. Oh, that person is this like, like this. Comparing them to the world. If you do that, your faith will not grow. It's just a loss for you. God continuously allows us and desires for us to challenge ourselves to save the two to seven nations and 5,000 people groups. Are you really living a walk of faith that is at peace, that's joyful, that does not want any other things? People who live a religious life of formality and who live with a legalistic condemning mindset, they can't say this. They cannot be at peace. They are unable to hear the voice of God that is given and that is heard in worship. What's the reason for them to come to church? You can just sit at home and watch online. Why would you live such a life? 
Therefore, in this year 2024, may all the religious life of formality and all legalistic condemning mindsets in me completely be discarded. And may I live a life of the gospel that saves others. I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay. Understand everyone and each other. As I'm doing the, my ministry, I've met murderers, I've met, I've met people who are in prison and criminals, but I understand them. Oh, that could be. It's plausible that they are where they are. I once could have been like that. I used to, you know, I used to be an athlete, and I was always, I such, I was always in such a hurry. I wonder whether I would have stayed still if someone bothered me. I probably would have done something about that. But because God gives me a heart of Jesus, that kind of situation never came. I said that to the prisoners in prison. I've never, I've never been in the field where I felt like I need to find someone. God protected me and He guarded me. So try believing in Jesus because if when you believe in Jesus, those situations do not come. May I not fall into temptation, says in the Lord's Prayer. That's the blessing that God gives to us. That is God's grace. If you are constantly in a conflict where you are angered and you need to fight with someone and you are in pitted against someone else, against someone, then you have no choice, right? But when you pray and you are completely armored in the gospel, then those situations don't come to you at all. There's no such thing. It does not come to you at all. It's quite strange, isn't it? And that is why it is by God's grace. May you live by grace, not by your will and not by your effort, but by God's grace. God, give me grace. How? If you have a legalistic mindset, it can't be. You have to completely be a gospel nature, saving one another, reviving one another, encouraging and comforting one another. You have to be fragrant of Jesus. May you live the kind of walk of faith. And may you come to the res conclusion and resolution that you will become a disciple of Christ in this upcoming year. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for protecting and giving us health in this year 2023 and even though there are many patients in the emergency room even now we thank you for giving us these environments and circumstances there's only a day left of 2023 may we all be able to discard what we must discard may we no longer be bowed in a religious life of formality and a legalistic condemning mindset but may we live a gospel nature that has a gospel perspective and save all lives and may we be those evangelists we pray this in jesus christ's name amen